welcome to Something to Talk About. I'm Linda McNamee, and for the next hour, we're going to be talking about something that is on pretty much everybody's minds right now, the back-to-school plan. But before I begin, um, I would like to invite you to uh, email me if you have a question for a future top or a suggestion for a future topic or a question for tonight's topic, you can email me at talk at bcattv.org. We will not be taking live calls this evening, even though we are live, because we have a lot to talk about and we wanna make sure that we get through everything um, that we plan. So I would like to um, encourage you to email me. I would like to thank the crew for this evening, which is the amazing John Vias. Thank you, John, for hanging out here at BCAT while Chris Flaherty is on vacation. And for the rest of the volunteers, I really miss you and can't wait to have a full crew back in the studio. And one last thank you. I would like to thank my husband, Paul, for staying home for daddy date night. And hopefully all is well at home. So now I would like to introduce my wonderful guest for this evening who has become kind of a celebrity around here. We have Dr. Eric Conti, who is the superintendent of schools here in Burlington. So welcome. Thank you for giving up yet another evening to come hang out at BCAT. Um, but being a parent of a couple of young children, kind of anticipating what the new year is gonna look like, mm -hmm. And I know several of my friends and colleagues are colleagues, other parents. Anyway, um, I'm sure that they're kind of curious as well. So sure. thank Every, you. Everyone's concerned and, and rightfully so. So anyway, um, I know this is kind of taking away from the topic at hand, but can you just give us a brief 20 second where you grew up, how you came to the Burlington area and how long you've been working with Burlington Public Schools? I grew up in Arlington next door, um, Arlington, Mass. And, um, and again, work and life ha have taken me uh, a bunch of different places. Um, I, my prior uh, school district was in Culpeper County, Virginia, prior to coming back. Wow. Um, my mom uh, passed about uh, 15 years ago, mm -hmm. um, and my dad was alone. And so I came back and um, um, just to be closer to to him he still lives in arlington where, where i grew up so cool. um this is my 13th year starting in burlington has um, been that long uh, <laughs> wow well, i'm feeling old um <laughs> so it's my 13th year and uh it's been it's been a real pleasure this is just a wonderful community to to do what i do uh for a living so i think the times are hard but the uh but the place is has been great and uh i again i appreciate uh, all of the burlington staff teachers everyone uh, are phenomenal and the community is very supportive and again parents like yourself so it, again if you're going to choose to do what I do for a living this is a great place to do it. Excellent and I do want to congratulate you on a recent award that you've gotten like within the past month or two? Uh, yes thank you and I, I always say any sort of acknowledgement of a superintendent is really the recognition of the work of others so I, I think it really is a it was a recognition of uh, I just have a great team uh, around me and and uh, they they all do great work so uh, it's really well, it it's, is it's nice a, to get recognized but, for uh, all of your hard work uh, and you know being a team leader so so, so thank you um, I have a bunch of questions here but it seems like you've been through this dog and pony show way too many times so currently mm -hmm. what is the plan for opening up all the schools or, or the new school year? Well, the state required us to work with three scenarios, right. uh, a full remote, um, a hybrid, some kids in, some kids out, and a full return. So okay. school back to um, all the kids back in. So we were required to uh, conduct a feasibility study looking at those three options. Three scenarios. Okay. So that was our, that was our requirement. Um, it was always about what to match with remote because what we are being told um, constantly throughout this process mm -hmm. is be prepared for closing the buildings again. And what that means is... <laughs> then why am I doing all this extra work? Well, that means be prepared for remote. Okay. So it was always about uh, can we have another option or another choice to accompany our remote, um, a remote option. And so that's really what we've been uh, working on. And... Um, 
last, uh, our, our deadline was originally uh, August 10th, Monday, which is why we scheduled the school committee meeting for Monday. I think last week it was expended, uh, extended to Friday. We have to submit our plan. And again, the school committee um, voted to support a hybrid plan um, with, again, a remote option um, into next fall. And now, did you like compare surrounding towns to kind of see what they were doing? Or was this just um, kind of like? We did, and okay. I'm talking to my colleagues in neighboring communities uh, every day or more than once a day. Um, I think one of our frustrations is the, the state didn't offer regional solutions or county-based solutions. So if there are you know 350 districts in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, um, we're all doing this work and uh, that causes some issues because it causes uh, comparisons, obviously. Um, did you know your neighbor's doing this? Yeah. Um, it also makes uh, childcare really hard because not every employee in Burlington, especially every teacher, lives in Burlington. So they're impacted both by the community where they live and where their children attend school um, and in the schedules that we, we create here. So I think it just added a layer of complexity. And then one of our sort of um, pre-show conversations were um, the choices are actually making the planning more difficult. Uh, it yeah. would be easier if we just said no one has a choice. Um, uh, this, this is exactly, uh, this is exactly what, what you're doing. Right. Um, but the choices mean um, we have to plan for uh, multiple you know, uh, situations. And then um, people want to know if, um, if they make a choice, can they change their choice? So it's not even about their first right. choice. It's, it's potentially about and um, how often can other change as well. Right. So uh, again, we're, we're looking at all of that. And, and I think the, the primary point of our planning is um, we're taking a um, sort of a, a, a multifaceted look at risk. So we're not just looking at risk in terms of associated with um, uh, getting a COVID infection. We're looking at risk. Uh, that's certainly what we're, that's one of our primary yeah. uh, risks we're looking at. But we're also looking at uh, the risks of keeping kids out of school. And there are also risks associated with that. Like the so, social aspects? That yeah, are, exactly, okay. and the learning aspects. And, and again, remote learning isn't for every student. And just, just I'm sure like being in school isn't for every right. student. Um, there are students who really need that in-person experience. Um, and so we're trying to provide some differentiation. We're trying to provide those options. And, and again, um, the more choices we make, uh, okay. the, harder, the harder it is, right? So that's always, uh, that's always uh, confusing. But we are looking at risk um, a, couple, a couple ways. Uh, not just associated with the virus. If it was only the virus we were worried about, um, I tell everyone to stay home. I tell everyone to you know make sure they wear masks and, and look at that. Um, also, none of us in the school district are claiming to be um, epidemiologists or, or virologists or experts in infectious disease. So we've been um, working with um, folks from the Harvard School of uh, Public Health okay. um, and Brigham and Women's. They have a group called Ariadne. And this group has done a lot of consulting um, in other school districts and other countries. Okay. And so we're trying to get our sort of our health guidance uh, from them. Okay. And um, and they're looking. Uh, they're telling us the best practices that have been executed sort of across the you know across the globe. Okay. And I think uh, Linda, the the context of where we are in Massachusetts and where we are in Burlington matters um, greatly. So, okay. Um, yeah, I would not want to be in Florida right now. Or we wouldn't even <laughs> be considering opening in Florida. And then, right. and then the, the, the shows or the, or the coverage of the high school in Georgia that opened up. And, exactly. And, and had, now um, 900 people are in quarantine or something? Uh, yeah, maybe. I think they had nine positive cases. Yeah, but but I'm know. saying if you saw the pictures of the hallways where uh, they were packed and the kids weren't wearing masks. Um, uh, again, so I, I think that's not what we're... Um, that's not the context um, okay. that we're trying to do our planning in. And, um, and the state has recently released um, metrics uh, okay. as well. So the governor's office has tried to provide every community sort of a, a red, yellow, green, okay. or white uh, category. Is white better than green? White is better than green. White is, I okay. don't think you have any cases. Oh, um, okay. And uh, there are many communities that are, um, have that status. And then, um, again, it's still a local decision, but I do think the state was trying to set up common, some common okay. metrics. And I think um, 
and 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 so I think that's that's been helpful. But they only came out yesterday, so um, okay. so a lot of our planning had to be done prior to the metrics being being had developed. to be done last week. Exactly, and so um, and even our work, uh, a lot of parents are saying um, the the uh, analysis of our heating and cooling systems isn't complete yet, and I'm uncomfortable making that decision oh, until okay. that work is complete. Again, we fully understand that, and um, we've been working on that for a while. But you can imagine all those firms are uh, very busy, and, and they all seem <laughs> because to they got to do it in three hundred. How many districts? Well, not just districts. Okay. I, I think many of them are doing it in in private sector, private businesses, okay. commercial spaces, and so um, part of the challenge is. And I'm sort of happy the governor has. Um, slowed down some of the state opening, okay. and I think one of the reasons he gave for doing that is is so that we could focus on opening schools. Oh, okay. And so again, I'm certainly biased, but I but I think if the resources had been sort of dedicated towards schools earlier, we we, we might have had more planning done or more more opportunities to to work with. But you know, it's a moving target, and you know, at least for air quality, I remember geez, almost 20 years ago, the place where I was working, we were complaining about air quality back then. True. And, and again, I... I <laughs> you know, even before and, and, everybody... And was fun, people are using that term. And um, when we are looking at air quality, we're, we are not testing for the virus. So there's no air quality test to say, okay. oh, you have so many virus particles in the air. Um, I think people are maybe making some correlations that... Uh, like filter. I that, would think it would be like a filtering... Well, that's more about the HVAC systems and oh, the air okay. quality testing, and then and then uh, we are we are doing both, okay. um, and we are trying to do that. And then, um, you know, people were concerned that we weren't testing 100% of the spaces in terms of air quality. And then again, I'm not an expert, but what I'm sort of hearing or learning about is, you know, they'll come out, they'll do a baseline test. Okay. Obviously, the kids aren't in the buildings yet. They'll try to get some, uh, again, some measurements. And then they'll come back the following week, maybe test a different, um, okay. a different thirty. So they're all snapshots in time because the air is constantly moving. So uh, it's not about going into a classroom and saying, "Okay, I'm going to sample this air today," uh, okay. yeah. and and this is going to be the the measure. So we are relying on some expertise. As soon as we get those results, we'll share them, and uh, that information may change the recommendation again of the school committee. We're all all realizing that things need to change, and as I said from the very beginning. Um, we have to make sure our remote plan is strong mm -hmm. because there could be um, multiple reasons why um, we would need to shift to a fully remote start, okay. um, you know, at any time. So right now, the current plan is, at least for the elementary schools, to be in five mornings a week, Yep. come home for lunch, uh -huh. and then four days have like an hour and a half of remote learning. Uh, like an hour, have a remote lesson in the Ro afternoon. So we're, 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 okay. I'm not sure the exact time. Okay. But uh, we're we're it's going to be the experience um, parents will have in the fall is going to be much different than the experience in the in the spring. So well, because the spring you guys were just thrown into it. The teachers were just thrown into it, and at least now it's like okay, we know what we're dealing with, sort of. Right. So <laughs> um, and and so I think the teachers are going to be better prepared. I think there's we've tried to do some professional development over the summer. Um, the state requirements are also very different where um, they're requiring more synchronous, more live teaching. Okay. Um, and so what we're trying to tell parents is that uh, the, the school day, we're going to try to um, be educating your child um, during the regular hours of a school day. Okay. So again, lack of a better t exact, say 8 to 2.30, 8 to 3 um, is when the school, the school time is going to be. Okay. Um, and that uh, we're going to try to provide as many as at the elementary school as many as much in-person time as possible okay. uh, during that time. Just watch your water next. I will. Year. I'm sorry. I have to move <laughs> my hands. And then gradually, um, and gradually try to extend that uh, if we get um, um, really uh, more proficient at the mechanics and the routines of school and okay. uh, things in the, our cases stay low. Mm -hmm. and um and also see how it works too i mean if it's see how it works too exactly and and so it's it, there are new routines for us and uh, we work closely with the board of health so um there'll be there are guidelines in terms of the decisions we have to make depending mm -hmm. on what happens how we communicate what's happening so there are a lot there are a lot of rules um uh, that we have to train people in and that we have to uh have to follow but the, again the board of health susan luminell have been extremely mm -hmm. helpful 
and have been great partners. Um, as I said, no one in the school is, is sort of an, an epidemiologist. Uh, but at least I, you're listening to epidemiology. Well, I, I can't yeah, even I keep say saying, that. Yeah, this is my uh, <laughs> this is my first pandemic, so I okay. said we'll, we'll we'll try. I'm sure if there's another one, we'll be we'll be better at it. So, <laughs> oh, please no. And again, what we were reflecting on too, Linda, and um, I'll get to your questions. I promise. When maybe, <laughs> no, maybe okay. we're answering some of them, is um, is it some of this is really heartbreaking because for you know for my career, you know for 25 years yeah. we've been trying to. Um, increase the amount of uh, collaborative learning for we've moved we've gotten rid of desks we put in tables we want students to work in groups we want them to problem solve together we want we don't want teachers uh, up in front of the class lecturing uh, lecturing yeah. we want them to be uh, involved and, and again our, our teachers are are very effective at that and and Burlington teachers are outstanding at developing uh, great relationships with their kids mm -hmm. and and it's almost like um, we have to revert back to some of the practices <laughs> yeah. uh, that we've been really trying <laughs> that to, we went uh, to school in. <laughs> yes, exactly. And and so uh, you know, everyone's saying, "Oh my God, the kids have to eat in their classroom." And again, I remember having lunch in in my class. I remember going home for lunch sometimes <laughs> too. So uh, it's it's we're reverting back to some, and not just the lunch, but we're right. reverting back to some instructional practices that I don't necessarily think are are um, are as effective for right. for all kids. But and, we do need to remember, like. You know, we had talked earlier that it hopefully is only temporary. Yes, it's you know one year out of a 13-year education. So, I don't know what percentage that is, but <laughs> so okay. We, well, we talked about yeah. you know the elementary plan. So my understanding, last I checked, was middle school and high school were going to be two days in, three days off, mm -hmm. and the student body was going to be divided into three groups. Student body is largely going to be divided in half. In half. But we will. But I thought we, there was like a, a there, there group is a third, C. There's a third group that are high need students. Okay. So, um, and that, that definition um, covers lots of areas. Okay. Um, and the expectation is for those students, um, they're going to need uh, more in-person time. More in-person, okay. Time. So we'll have some students in person two days, some potentially three, four, or five. Okay. So it depending what their needs are and, and, and the cohort they're okay. in. And the two days would rotate, you know, either Monday, Tuesday, or Thursday, Friday. Yes, we're gonna do and sort then, of an, an AA with a combined day and then a BB okay. uh, is, the, is the rotation. Um, we looked at a bunch of things. We talked to a lot of our neighboring uh, communities and high schools. Okay. Um, there was some talk of having students on a week rotation, week on, week off. Yeah, I was gonna ask about that. Um, some of the feedback that we got from some of our educators were that uh, that was too long to go without um, okay. uh, seeing a student. Uh, there was some talk about having kids do two weeks on, two weeks off, because that would be the quarantine time, the 14 days. So again, I, I think we looked at a bunch of different models okay. and and, um, and most of the schools that I'm aware of has um, who aren't returning, all students are looking at some sort of uh, two days on, um, three days off. Okay type of schedule. Because one of your Thursday presentations, I don't remember which one, mm -hmm. talked about wanting to rotate it because of all the Monday holidays. Mm -hmm. So That's a possibility and I think the schools are going to look at that. Okay. Uh, we're really trying to keep the high school and middle school on a pretty similar uh, structure. Okay. Um, there's going to be some differences obviously, but we want the structure to be somewhat the same. Mm -hmm. um, we're trying to make sure the cohorts of students um, have all kids in the same family, so we're not splitting families. And then family structures are much more complex now, so it's not <laughs> as easy as saying his last name, yeah. right? So, so we're looking right. at that. And then there are either some other extenuating circumstances where there are um, families whose living situation might be that we need to group them together as, as well. So okay. I think w we have some fine tuning to do. Um, um, and then um, contributing to the fine tuning is oh. choice. So uh, we recently surveyed parents again after the school committee decision. Um, I filled out my survey today. You did. So we've, we've probably had about a, a thousand responses so far. And it's tracking, honestly, it's tracking very close to where the initial survey was. Oh, so we, okay. we have about 19% uh, um, of families want their child fully remote. And about 80% are, um, so far, the surveys returned, want their child to, to uh, come back to an in-person okay. experience. So 
the models that you're discussing or you have been discussing okay. are for the 80% of, okay. of, um, of students who are returning. Okay. Um, so now, if somebody, gonna... part of those 80%, mm -hmm. if a family decides to do the hybrid model yep. and then decides, okay, this isn't what I'm expecting, I want my child to be fully remote mm -hmm. or vice versa, can they change? The answer is yes, <laughs> um, but not instantaneously. Okay. So it's going to be far easier for us to take a student from in school and have them be remote because okay. we're going to have more options. And if we don't have to uh, worry about placing the student in a classroom, okay. it's easier for us. Um, we are in our discussions um, asking par parents to maybe make that choice of being fully remote and into school uh, quarterly. Um, okay. So that would give us some time. Um, there may be possibilities we could do it sooner, again, depending on the situation. Um, we are trying to, when we are scheduling our students, mm -hmm. and please tell me if I'm not explaining this well, okay. we are building our schedules like 100% of the students are returning. So okay. we're going to create space and slots and uh, at the elementary level class assignments for your children, mm -hmm. even if you're going to keep your children home. At home. So if you change your mind or if something happens, you as the the administration doesn't have to redo everything. Well, I think parents want to know um, if I do return my child to school, who's their teacher going to be? Well, and, yeah. and so, um, I, <laughs> my I, I, son's so, been bugging me so since. I, I'm, so I'm, I'm, we're going to try to have that already assigned. I also don't want to say we can't take your child back because we don't have the room. don't have the room. Okay. So I think we're going to try to do that, um, and. Um, I, I, again, that's that's what we're going to try to do, okay. and um, we're, we'll have to see. And then we also need to see, um, you know, what what teachers are available, and okay. because we need to have a, if we have twenty percent of our students roughly who are not returning, mm -hmm. that's that's say six to seven hundred students. Um, we also are responsible for providing their education, uh, taking attendance every day, keeping track of right. those okay. children. Um, the first choice for those kids would be Burlington teachers teaching them. Okay. So if we have to create a remote team, then we're pulling teachers out of the classroom, the classroom to do that. Um, I don't think it's possible to do both simultaneously. Okay. Um, again, there could be some situations I can imagine, but I'm just saying as a general rule. Mm -hmm. So we either need to backfill the in-school spots that those teachers would be teaching okay. or look for other opportunities to uh, educate the students who are fully remote. So I, okay. I think, again, the, the the choice of being in school mm -hmm. or out of school um, makes it a little bit more um, complex. And you could say, well, you know, Eric, the easy solution there is just do fully remote, right? That would be the easy solution. Um, <laughs> not my, but not the, in my house. But, but I'm saying, but the trouble is, um, right. um, there are many families and parents, and again, looking at risk in that dual way, right. there are many kids who need to be, um, um, would benefit from being back in school. So okay. I think if you look at our plan, we are prioritizing younger students. Again, they're gonna mm -hmm. be back five days a week. Um, we do feel that uh, our teachers can do an effective job um, both in person and remotely mm -hmm. as the students uh, get older. Uh, and if you had to tell me I had to pick one school to be remote and focus my attention, again, I would choose the older students to be fully remote and again, would really try to make sure the younger kids have, a, have an in-school experience. Okay. I'm almost afraid to ask this, but I know it's been on some people's minds. Um, are there, what kind of accommodations, if any, have been made for either single parents or working parents? You know, because the school day will be chopped up, right. and if somebody's trying to work or has to work, then yes. you have a whole other realm of childcare issues. Exactly, and um, childcare issues are obviously both for the staff, the teachers, people working in the district, right. as well as the families who, um, who are who are in the community because um, you know <clears throat> schools aren't supposed to be the babysitters but in a lot of cases they have to be so we provide a safe place for children during the day and and uh, I, I sort of I understand that aspect of of our role um, what I would 
sort of ask is for some patience. I think we need to start cautiously, um, which is the reason for the shortened day. Mm -hmm. um, I think if we do this well, um, schools are more than more likely to stay open longer and we're okay. more likely to get more time in. I know that might be a frustrating answer to some. Why can't you just open? If you're going to have all kids in for three hours, why not a full day? Um, and I think that's really the reason is we, is we want to we want to see kind how it goes. Test the waters first. Um, yes, and, and again, yeah. I want to make sure. I mean, if we're going to demand the kids are in masks, and then you know, no one can sit in a mask for six hours. Um, so I think we just want to uh, make sure that uh, we do this. You know, we, we do this well. Um, I also think that we are um, looking at um, the after-school program. Um, for, um, to make sure that we have the space and room to run the after-school program. Okay. It's going to have to run a little bit differently, but we think that um, um, we're working on a plan now. We're going to share that plan with the Board of Health, okay. and there's a state agency that also has to approve that plan. Okay. And so um, we're working on that, and hopefully we'll have some uh, after-school options, expanded after-school options for, mm. um, uh, for families. Um, okay. We would certainly prioritize uh, essential workers because we're being asked asked to do that. Okay. And then uh, any hardship, um, w you know, we would try to accommodate uh, okay. that family. We are talking about having the after school program end at four. So again, it wouldn't be uh, six o'clock. But uh, no, w would there also be a, a before school? Okay. No, um, and just because we didn't, th we don't think we could manage it before school, and we're okay. trying to put all of our planning into. Um, into that after school block of time mm -hmm. um, and then we, we haven't even gotten to transportation yet which is which is our <laughs> yeah let's is, not talk about ta is, transportation uh, right now a, that's a, just another another challenge um, but what's interesting when I talk to my colleagues and some neighboring communities is that um, Burlington is often is is so generous and um, and sometimes I think people lose <laughs> sight of that when they yeah. when they live in the community that um, you know any change or, or, or any adjustment feels like a loss and f it feels like a reduction. So there are many districts that don't provide any transportation or provide right. uh, only provide transportation after two miles away from a school okay. or charge for transportation. Or charge for transportation. Yeah. So any of those adjustments um, don't feel like a loss. But when Burlington provides a seat for every child, whether you use it or not, mm -hmm. at no cost, and we really don't have a distance requirement. Um, we're not going to be able to do that. So right. um, we might institute what many districts do as standard practice, a two-mile radius. Okay. And it's going to be upsetting to people, and um, that's that's one of the hardships, right? So uh, some of the sidewalks around town might need some work. Well, <laughs> again, I, I think it's uh, the the sidewalk committees at town meeting have been very yep. prescient. I, I think that's that's a, that's a good thing, and we should identify safe routes to school. Um, and make sure our kids are walking or riding their bikes mm -hmm. or do whatever. But all I'm saying is uh, because Burlington, um, the expectation is so high. Yeah, the bar is set really high, it's, so anything. It's, 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 uh, it's, you know, it's, it's easy for us to fall. We have a, an excellent after-school program as well. And again, um, ending at four as opposed to ending at six is going to feel like a, 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 it is. It's a, it's a, yeah, it's, it's going to be hard. It's a, it's a service that we're not extending, but I think we're, you know, we, we've been there. So we're, again, trying to be as flexible as possible, but mm -hmm. oftentimes flexibility adds um, complexity to the, to the solution. So Now, I understand that, you know, after school, the, pro the after school program is necessary, especially in a lot of the, the elementary schools. But what about like, has there been any discussion about extracurriculars, whether it's sports or whether it's like the chess club or student council yeah. or, um, I'm gonna are those all on hold right I'm gonna now? Separate them, separate them into two buckets. Okay. Uh, athletics is, is one bucket and um, there's a, a state agency, the MIAA, the Massachusetts Interscholastic Athletic Association, um, that is working with the state on, um, on possibilities. Okay. Um, they've delayed any sort of um, guidance until September 14th. So what I'm sort of saying is um, fall sports are, again, I don't even have an answer for you until okay. after September 14th. I would say, um, especially for the high-risk sports, and they've classified them mm -hmm. all, 
Um, highly unlikely that there'll be a, uh, a fall season. Could the okay. seasons be moved to spring, possibly? Um, and, um, you know, but could a, a low incident sport, uh, golf, cross country, could, could yeah. they run? Again, they could possibly have an abbreviated season. So okay. um, I think we'll look to um, provide every opportunity for kids to participate if possible. School clubs, um, we're really being encouraged to not have the buildings open after school, to not okay. have any outside groups in. Um, is this like a state mandate or a state um, suggestion? I think it's or? just a, the, not, <laughs> the state's not mandating much, which is frustrating. I think oh, there's sort yeah. of strong guidance that uh, okay. they, they want to uh, introduce as few people into the buildings as, as possible. Okay. Um, but I think we're evaluating those on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay. Are there clubs that could meet remotely? Absolutely. Okay. If that means kids could have a social experience um, but not be in school with chess club, then we'll we'll look at that. But yeah. uh, it's kind of um, hard to play chess remotely. But something like student council, um, would, would you'd be, be able surprised. To. I think uh, <laughs> I think there's lots of uh, gaming that can okay. happen remotely these days. <laughs> all, all I'm saying is is I think we're going to look at those on a case by case basis. Okay. We're going to try to um, you know see the need, see the demand, and we will certainly try to um, provide as many opportunities for okay. for students and and to to have you know to have those experiences. I, I just don't have a list right now of what we're going to run and what we're not going to run. Um, we'll, we'll have to, we'll see. So we're talking about the plan for reopening. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure it's on your mind as well as all the teachers' mind. What is that threshold to back up the plan and go full remote? Um, I think there could be a number of triggers for that. And the school committee will ultimately make that decision, I okay. think, in consultation with uh, with the Board of Health is, is really what I think. So there's no real good analogies for a pandemic. So mm -hmm. I, I have a hard time doing that. But when we... Just because the last one was over 100 years ago. <laughs> but when we... Um, um, let's say there's a, 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 a fire, even a fire alarm or, or, or smoke in a, mm -hmm. in a school building. Um, we pull the fire alarm, the, the firemen come in, there, there's, there's a, a, there'll be a ranking fireman who, who comes into the building. Mm -hmm. Um, sort of at that point, um, that person with the expertise is in charge of the building. Okay. So if that person says you have to evacuate the building, um, I'm not going to say um, no. No, <laughs> sorry, uh, uh, the, the kids are going to stay here. So I, I think in um, I think on sort of a much larger scale, okay. we'll have a bunch of factors. I think that um, I'm trying to uh, coordinate planning on the educational side. But if um, the Board of Health comes in and says, okay, local rates are uh, spiking um, okay. for the safety of the community, really, we recommend or strongly recommend you do something like this. Um, just like the fire marshal, I'm, I'm probably not going to say, <laughs> oh, uh, you know. No, I, I think I, we need to go back into school. I have that expertise. So, um, okay. again, our HVAC systems, if they fail miserably, um, that would be something that we look at. Does it have to be all schools, all levels? Um, Again, I, I don't know. So could mm -hmm. the high school fail and could we still have elementary school kids in? Yeah, maybe. But I would really take that guidance um, okay. from the, um, even though it's not my decision, I would take that guidance from the Board of Health and in my conversations with the school committee, okay. I think they're speaking um, closely with the Board of Health as well. And okay. again, we, we want to do what's best for kids always, but I think some of these decisions are also what's best, mm -hmm. for, the, best for the community. And then... My plug is, even if you don't have children in school, practicing um, mask wearing, hand washing, and practicing the precautions, keeping the, the, the rate in Burlington as low as possible helps, helps everybody. Because mm -hmm. we're only sort of as safe as a community as the people who practice the least amount of caution. So we, re right. we, really, we really need to um, ask people to be um, um, careful. Well, just the nature of, of the beast. It's like you don't know who's a carrier. You don't know where people have been. So, yes. I mean, as a parent, I could go to a grocery store with, with a non-parent, and then I could pick something up and bring it to my kids. And then, you know, so you're right. We need to be cautious. Right. And, again, my, my, poor, analog <laughs> my poor analogy is going to be, again, um, um, four inches of snow 
doesn't necessarily mean there's a snow day. So there's, there's no single measurement <laughs> that I say, okay, we crossed that threshold, um, there's no school. Now there are things that guarantee there's no school. If a governor declares a state of emergency, like he did with this, then that's no school. Um, I work with the DPW, just like I work with the Board of Health. Mm -hmm. If the DPW says the roads are horrible. loud, or the okay. roads are horrible, <laughs> or um, we had a lot of snow, but we got on top of it and we're ready and we feel like you know the buses can be safe, um, then we may have school. Now does every sidewalk have to be plowed? Um, does every, does there need to be black pavement everywhere? Um, um, you know, maybe not, and mm -hmm. maybe we can still have school, maybe we have a delay, maybe there's some sort of other um, decision that we have to mm -hmm. make, but it, it's, it's, rarely, it's rarely an absolute, and I think looking at a whole bunch of factors, and please, I'm not equating the risk with COVID with the risk of snow, I'm just right, trying no. to talk about sort of the decision making. Right, um, okay. I think we will consult. Um, I don't think there's going to be any one trigger or one factor um, um, that uh, that you does that. You kind of have to look at the whole big picture and all the pieces because it 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 is really complex. Right. So is it is it the number of people in the last 14 days uh, out of 100,000 who've been identified positive? Is it the overall positivity rate? Again, I, I think there are people who have that expertise. Mm -hmm. I do not. Who will help um, us uh, make those uh, make those decisions? And then we, we um, again, we will try to have as much in-person education as possible just because um, we, we think that's important. Now, there has been a lot of talk right now, you know, about keeping the kids safe. What practices or what has been implemented to keep the staff and the teachers safe? Is it the same or have there been other practices well that I, I think it's I think it's largely the same I think we're trying to prepare um, and to have as much uh, PPE uh, available as, as needed mm -hmm. I think we've taken a higher um, a position on sort of higher metrics than the state has is sort of saying we could we could get away okay. with um, we're requiring all students pre-K to 12 to wear masks. The state is only requiring from second grade second on. Grade up, yeah. So we're saying everyone should be in a mask. Um, from the folks that I'm talking with, again, from this Ariadne group, um, they kept saying that, you know, if you could only pick one, one practice, mm -hmm. um, mask wearing, they said, is by far uh, the, most, the most important. Um, they don't even recommend the plexiglass dividers in classrooms okay. that we discussed before. Right. They feel it's another surface that could um, that you have to clean that could be problematic, mm -hmm. and they don't they didn't see sort of in some of all their research any sort of increased efficacy with with any sort of partitions. So I'd say um, you asked uh, specifically about the teachers. I mm -hmm. think we are um, again having all kids wear masks. I think we are um, encouraging as much outdoor. Um, instruction as possible. I think we are, uh, the state is saying three feet, you know, at a minimum. We're um, at six or very close to six. Oh, okay. Because um, one of the things that I was watching, one of your updates, I thought it was like four and a half feet. Well, but I think if we have all students back and okay. without adding a fourth grade at Francis Wyman or a fourth grade at Fox Hill, I don't think we could make the claim that we had six feet everywhere. Okay. But I think we were committed to adding those two extra classes and the parents okay. in those schools will know what I'm talking about. We just have, we had a larger class, I think of 22. Well, Pine Glen had the same thing um, a few years ago. So so um, if we added a section, I think we could get our spacing uh, very close to uh, very close to six feet. Oh, okay. um, and then if we have 20% of our students who are going to be fully mm -hmm. remote, I think that would also allow us to add spacing. But again, as I have discussed with the teachers, as I'll say with everyone else, um, kids aren't static beings, so even if we have them or have the space for six feet apart, um, it, it's always going to be a, a, a moving target. And, okay. and I think we're going to, um, again, we're going to have to spend some time, but I think mask wearing is the most. We have um, hand sanitizing stations. Um, we've added um, in high traffic areas. Okay. Um, we've tried to build in uh, hand washing uh, time in our schedules to make sure kids are, okay. are, um, are cleaning their hands. And singing and, happy birthday. And singing happy birthday. <laughs> and we also have a very um, stringent uh, protocol for parents in terms of um, 
the state is really asking parents to do a lot of the health screening of their children before sending them to school. So I'm not saying... I think that's my biggest concern because there's always been, you know, the here, take some ibuprofen and go off to school anyway. Um, I, I get it, but that, we have to trust one another. Right. I mean, as I said, we're, <laughs> we're only as safe as the people pa- practicing right. the least amount of caution. Right. And so we re- would really ask uh, parents to keep their children home if they're uh, displaying, you know, any symptoms. We'd ask our staff to stay home if they're, if they're mm-hmm. feeling, um, you know, feeling like they're having any, any, any symptoms. So um, I, I think that's what we're doing. We, we feel like there's a... Um, Massachusetts as a commonwealth um, has handled this better than many states. Really well, yeah. Um, so I, I think our, our rate is low, and that's not in every community. I think the governor has identified those mm-hmm. communities. I like the fact that they're going to focus more resources on those communities to try to get the, the rates down um, because the virus doesn't know town lines, right? So right. so we, we all have to practice that. And um, so I'm hoping the, the state is providing us the context And then the community of Burlington is also providing us the context where we can um, open school up, uh, again, cautiously. Okay. Now, it's not on here, so feel free to say I don't want to talk about it. But as we're talking, when I volunteered in my my children's elementary classroom, there was always like a tray of pencils Mm -hmm. and common scissors and common color crayons. And we've been very lucky in the past where the schools do provide children with all the supplies that they need. But do you see that changing coming this year where each kid should provide his or her own pencils? And um, Linda, I, I mean... <laughs> I don't mean to put you on the spot. No, no, I, 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 like, I, think, I think the plan is that we would provide that. And this is one of the... Because it's just another level of cleaning. Sure, but and, this, this is one of the heartbreaking sort of yeah. uh, items in, in that... Um, you know, sharing is such an important. Um, you You're telling know, your kids skill. to share, and then okay, don't give them your pencil. So, but you know. but I, I do think, um, in a lot of the purchasing, especially at the elementary level, there are a lot of. Um, I'm I'm going to use an older term. I'm sorry, pencil boxes or or. or oh, they're still around. Oh, containers. <laughs> um, so so I think the idea is to try to provide each student with their own set of materials, okay. and then not have them share. And that's really twofold. It's it's to not have students sharing materials but also uh, having the student take those materials um, home with them. Oh, because, because of the it, split, the hybrid model. Well, hybrid, and if we have to shut down schools, um, we, all of our instruction can't be uh, technology-based either. So, um, so many families have access to all the materials we have in school, but there are some families who, who don't. So we would okay. be, again, providing uh, some of those materials because you know every young child should play with glitter glue and sort of have sort <laughs> oh, no. of some of those. <laughs> no, glitter. You know, some of have those, you know, have those experience. So so even if we're talking about our full remote experience or okay. even the hybrid where there's a remote component, that doesn't necessarily mean screen time. And I think that was a concern uh, okay. shared by many parents in the spring. What about the component of homeschooling? Mm-hmm. Have you seen any trends where that is becoming a more popular option? Um, I think we've seen some families uh, sign up for it, which um, I haven't seen a a huge influx. And again, I I always laugh about uh, some of the issues in Burlington. Um, You know, the the transportation issues, Burlington's 11 square miles. My prior district was 380 square miles. So (laughs) so I'm saying- Little difference. Well, right. So um, I think I had a a homeschool population in Virginia of close to six or 700 students. So, we probably have seen an uptick, but an uptick in single digits, not um, okay. as we get closer, we may see more homeschooling um, applications. Uh, I'm a supporter of, of, of that choice for, for families that has always exist existed. Mm-hmm. Um, and we'll try to provide as much support for homeschooling families uh, as we can. So it's not, I think we always, we always think about that that's going to be a future Burlington student. So it's not a, it's not, it's not okay. a value judgment. It's not a judgment at all. Um, and if families, if that's best for them at this mm-hmm. time, that's great. But uh, even in terms of supporting with some materials or having okay. con- communication or making sure, um, um, again, we're trying to be as supportive as possible because the following year that child could end up um, okay. back in school. And just to clarify that homeschool is definitely different than full remote. Yes. Okay. 
homeschooling. I'm thinking that you're thinking yes. that, but people no, at home no, might be going. Homeschooling, you were drawing the child from Burlington Public Schools, and the parents are then responsible. We have okay. to approve the plan. Um, we still have a little bit of say, but um, but the parents are fully responsible for providing the education for their child. Okay. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Oh my. <laughs> This looked like a lot before, but um, what are we forgetting about? Oof. There's probably a lot I'm forgetting about. I'm, I'm, I'm waking up sort of I know, uh, I know. trying to, um, trying to okay. not, not, uh, not say anything, I, I, not, uh, not forget anything. Um, I, I think that um, um, we are trying to make sure kids continue to learn Again, social, emotionally, okay. and and sort of academically. Ah, I do I, have another question. So for you. go ahead. We talked about masks. Yes. Some people have talked about face shields. Uh -huh. Pros and cons, and similarities and differences of those two subjects. Um, Devices. We are being told. I'm being told again by the folks I'm working with from Ariadne Labs that a face shield is not a replacement for a mask. So they okay. said you have to mandate masks. If people want to wear a face shield with a mask, that's fine with them. Okay. Um, but a face shield by itself is not, um, is not enough. Not, as, not sufficient. So um, people have asked about compliance. W what are you going to do if a child refuses to wear a mask? Again, there are all these exceptions, and we're trying <laughs> to think through all of them. Right. Um, and uh, again, if it's a sensory... Uh, getting a kindergartner to cooperate is Well, just I'm saying if it's a sensory disability, then, then that's a whole other story. Okay. But if it's, if it's just someone who's being obstinate, then, then again, just like any other store um, or Dunkin' Donuts wouldn't let the high schooler in to buy coffee without a mask, we're not going to allow the high schooler in the high school without a mask. So okay. I'm saying I think that's, uh, that's going to be um, clear. And again, we'll, mm -hmm. we'll try to... Um, manage that uh, as, as best we can um, and uh, we'll we'll try to figure it out I think we are um, again transportation is a is a sort of we, we haven't gotten uh, there yet mm -hmm. um, probably if we could spend some time talking about what full remote learning is because I also think there's some questions about sure. um, full remote learning again we've spent most of our time this evening talking about the hybrid the plan. Hybrid. Uh, the full remote, again, our first choice would be for Burlington teachers to teach the students who are fully remote as well. Okay. Um, that experience would be very different from the spring, much more structure. Okay. Um, we would expect the school day to run almost the same hours or the, as the okay. uh, in-person school day. And the remote wouldn't necessarily just be like a camera in the classroom having that child look in on the normal classroom setting. Uh, no. This is like instruction no and again I, I'm, I'm saying there there, <laughs> there may be times where where that's something that we would want to do okay. but that would be the exception not the rule okay. the, the rule would be um, a separate Burlington teacher assigned to a group of remote students so like a remote second grade teacher teaching all remote second graders maybe um, I'm not sure if we would have enough or the the remote would match up wonderfully it would be great if I had a remote set of teachers and a, the kids evenly divided uh, in That'd terms of nice. their remote, but I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> um, it may be that we would have a, uh, a remote elementary teacher teaching, um, again, a remote group of second graders, but maybe not all from one school. So you might have okay. a, a second grade teacher from Fox Hill teaching second graders district remotely from all over the district. So um, That's what I was getting at. I just didn't know how to... So I think that's what we're doing. Um, or that's what we're going to try to Hope. do. If we if we don't have good matches, um, or we have holes, um, then we're going to have to fill those holes. Again, we are responsible for taking attendance and educating the okay. child, whether they are in school um, or or remote. Um, when it comes to subject areas um, and licensing, again, not every teacher can teach calculus. Not every teacher can teach. <laughs> not uh, every teacher would want to teach calculus. Advanced placement physics. <laughs> So um, I think we may, um, again, we will prioritize Burlington teachers. I think I've said that about eight times. I'll mm -hmm. continue to say that. But there, we may have other um, holes to fill where okay. we would look for uh, potentially other um, 
other delivery models. Okay. And then we're in very early stages too with um, some of my colleagues, and I know this gets a little bit complex, mm -hmm. is if there's a physics teacher at Bill Ricca High School teaching remotely, and I have the AP biology teacher, and if the kids are remote anyway, yeah. um, looking Could sort of partner? maybe partnering and regional, you know, because we feel like that local teacher, the live teacher is still the best, is still the best option. Right. Um, again, trying to get our own house in order before we start um, doing some other things, but right. we're, we're trying to think as creatively as possible and, um, and uh, provide as, as well-rounded a schedule as we can. One of the things that we're doing, which I think is, um, again, is wonderful for kids, but <laughs> problematic for planning, is we're not reducing our um, curriculum at all. We're not narrowing at all. So okay. one of the things I read is when Germany went back, they went back on an abbreviated day, sort of similar to what we're doing at the elementary school, okay. but they only did um, literacy and mathematics. Okay. Um, so it would be easier if we could narrow the choices the students are making, okay. um, but then that would limit the experience the students are having So just as well. like shorter periods of, you know, still doing all the subjects, just shorter time? Well, exactly. So again, even if you look at the high school and the middle school, um, some folks are saying, well, they're only meeting uh, twice a week or, or how many times a week. Um, we could have five meetings a week, mm -hmm. some in person, some remote, but then we couldn't, um, we'd have to get rid of some of the curricular experiences okay. that kids were having. So I think that's uh, part so of like the like not offer too. the AP Calc or AP History or something. Right. We're again, not, we don't want to do that. No, right. So again, I think we would probably keep our academics. I think, I think the, okay. the, the subjects that would suffer sort of first, and, and I don't even think it's fair, would be some of our specialist courses because I think those are some really enjoyable um, things okay. why kids come to school and I think they're important learning experiences you know in and uh, you know unto themselves as well um, we do have different um, guidelines when it comes to uh, singing um, instrument playing I was just about to ask I you I know that. you were I could tell so uh, <laughs> so I, I think um, have a budding musician at home who's and, and uh, physical education I think they're discouraging us initially from having those uh, classes inside I think if they are inside, um, I think there's, um, our teachers are very talented and creative, but maybe they do uh, more rhythms, more drumming. Okay. I think strings instruments aren't the problem. It's the droplets through yeah. blowing instruments. Obviously that's the problem with singing too. Um, I think they're saying kids can sing in masks, but they need to be uh, 10 feet apart. And again, okay. they really want some of those activities to take place. Um, uh, outside if possible okay. again still distanced but outside uh, outside um, so we're looking into that and again um, because those experiences are really important mm -hmm. um, mr. Buxbaum the high school band teacher has put a whole very well thought out um, remote band camp um, <laughs> proposal together cool. um, and I think what we you know, again we're I know mr. Sullivan supporting supporting that okay. and um, again that's one of those case-by-case -case basis basis uh, decisions that we're making but again realizing that's very important to uh, mm -hmm. uh, to students uh, lunch comes up quite a bit and you might not have a lunch question but okay. uh, why only have lunch at the middle school um, not at the elementary not at the high school uh, some parents and some folks don't even want us to have it at the middle school um, I think lunch because students masks are off um, again in terms of activities in school would be a higher risk activity than anything that would take place with a mask on. Um, whether it's incredibly high or sort of people, some okay. people feel differently about it. Um, now would the lunch still take place in the individual classroom? Well, yes, but we also have children with life-threatening allergies, so we would need to make sure that we provided a, um, a, a safe, uh, safe environment for, okay. for those, those children. Um, we would need to get um, our cafeteria staff uh, trained up. Um, we're still responsible for providing meals for our food insecure children. Okay. So even if we're not serving lunch, we need to have um, bag lunches okay. or to-go lunches. And I think the way the reimbursements are working because of some of the issues is, is um, we may be able to provide lunch for um, all students in sort of a grab and go way. Okay. But in terms of having lunch in school, we wanted to start small. on a small scale. Um, 
and we were starting with the with the middle school um, and to work out some of the uh, logistics and uh, some people are calling that an experiment we shouldn't experiment other people are saying if kids can have snack why can't they all have lunch um, the, the, so wait, they are still having snack like in the elementary schools? That's I think I, I don't think the permissible? kids can go three hours without without a snack. True. But does it have to be in the classroom? Could it be outside? Um, I, I think we're. But gonna, then what do you do with rains? <laughs> yeah, and and again, or I, snows. I, I think um, in a lot of the countries that have opened up, um, y you know, uh, what, what's the saying? There's no there's no bad weather, just bad clothes. So I think they're being more. Um, um, yeah, but eating a soggy tuna fish sandwich in the rain is just... I, I, again, Lyndon, yeah. no, e no easy answers, but, <laughs> I, know, uh, I, I, but, but I, I do think we're going to have to have a snack time for our, yeah. for our, our kids. Um, and I do think um, we have to work out the logistics of lunch. And our plan would be to uh, do that carefully and well and then expand um, okay. lunch and extend the day. Um, you know, at the at the high school and at the uh, at the elementary school, I do want to take a minute to thank the Burlington Food Pantry. While we're on the topic of lunch, they have done a phenomenal job. They, they've just been incredible, and uh, I think we're going to need to take over some of those responsibilities okay. um, going into the fall. So uh, I think we will have some kitchens open, but whether we're okay. serving large scale lunch or just providing, um, again, lunch for our food insecure or for a broader. Uh, a broader population, mm -hmm. um, we, we, we have yet to sort of work out the final I just details. have this vision of like the cafeteria person pushing one of those big carts mm -hmm. and just delivering to each classroom. I, again, that was a, a very <laughs> familiar memory that I have in, uh, from my elementary school days, but, uh, but I'm saying I think, um, I think there are a lot of logistical issues with that. And again, um, But instead of having all the kids go to the cafeteria, have the cafeteria come to them or something. I don't know. Well, again, we, we can't. We're really trying to keep our gatherings of yeah. t to 25 or, or below. So, um, you know, at some of our cafeterias, you can have 200, you know, right. 300 students. And um, th there's just um, no impossible. way we could do that. And if we maybe could have one or two students um, distance at a cafeteria table, and that would be it. So we just wouldn't have the space or the right. room to uh, No, but I'm thinking like the cafeteria lunch. delivering food to the classrooms. Right, which takes time. Which takes a lot of time, and yeah. So, and um, so instead of having lunch in an hour, we might have a three-hour lunch. So I think those okay. are some of the logistics that we have to, um, we have to work out. So, um, and the adults need lunch, too. Uh, and the adults, the adults need a safe place to uh, eat their lunches. And, <laughs> and escape um, the children. And part of the caf benefit of a cafeteria is you can have a few adults monitoring lots of children. If we have the kids divided up in 40 or 50 classrooms, then you need 40 or 50 adults to um, right. to be in those classrooms to monitor. So, again, there's um, <laughs> the puzzle. Uh, you can go down lots of rabbit holes. I think the puzzle the yeah, puzzle no. is there. I, I think um, I think we're trying to uh, talk to people as close to the jobs as possible to okay. get their input. So obviously, we're talking to cafeteria workers about the lunches. We're talking to custodians about the cleaning. Talking to uh, uh, teachers about um, you know the schedules and some of the logistics and problems mm -hmm. and uh, and I do think people have contributed solutions um, it is really easy to poke holes in anything that we're doing and I'll acknowledge that I have doubts I I, I sort of say oh my but god like, what if, what about this what about that like you said there's so many different variables that it, it's physically impossible to cover every basis and again, I'm told by, again, the medical people who we're dealing with, uh, the risk will never be zero. So you want to try to minimize it as much as you can mm -hmm. and then um, practice um, good precautions and then really work closely with the Board of Health to make decisions um, moving forward. Um, one other thing, Linda, that, uh, again, I know I should be waiting for your questions. <laughs> no, that's okay. We're almost questions. out of time, so just wrap, so, uh, you one can of them just wrap is, it up. Uh, is information if there is a positive COVID case. Uh -huh. I think there, there, there's probably going to be some frustration, and I think we need to make sure we're talking to families about that. Uh, not everyone is entitled to that information. So there's still a lot of privacy that we need to okay. um, maintain. I think the protocol will be, obviously, um, people who are in close contact um, with a person, and I think there's a definition of what close contact is. Uh, that's including the adults, the families, the, mm -hmm. the staff, 
um, need to be notified, but the entire district doesn't need to be notified if right. there's if there's a, a case at a particular building. And nor I don't think it's encouraged that that sort of happen. Right. Unlike in most uh, most communication from the district that comes from the district, a lot of the communication about testing and um, you know any cases will come through the board of health. So I think that's just uh, the the protocol that. Um, that the state is asking that we follow and that the, the Board of Health is asking that we're following. Again, they've been a phenomenal partner. But I, I do think I do think people's want um, wanting to know this information is out of a caution and fear. I don't think yeah. anyone has a bad intention. But uh, I already know we're going to frustrate some people because our communication is not going to be uh, as complete. And if they're not uh, closely uh, contacted or associated with the case, mm -hmm. um, then we probably won't be able to share information. Right. And one case doesn't mean a school closes. I think, um, again, there'll be some rules there and uh, we, we need to, we'll, we'll follow again the direction of the Board of Health. Okay. Well, we are out of time. I know. So thank you very much. And of course, now all these questions are popping into my head. But you will be continuing to do your weekly updates, yep. I'm guessing? Sure. Okay. And we're trying to pick a topic. So because we could sit here for six hours and not cover everything, so we're right. trying to pick narrow slices and then have those narrow slices available as we move forward. And then hopefully things don't change. Like I said, the state just released uh, okay. metrics yesterday and, and things could change tomorrow. So right. um, we're trying to be as flexible as we can and we appreciate uh, everyone's patience. And again, I just have to, the buildings have been open since March. I think our custodians, secretarial staff, our central office, everyone's been working really hard and coming in. Mm -hmm. and, and I know many of our teachers have been um, really scrambling this summer to get in professional development, to learn new skills. So uh, everyone I've talked to said this wasn't much of a, wasn't much of a no, summer. So I don't think we it's are a in uncharted anybody, territory. So uh, I just really appreciate everyone in the district's right. work. Well, thank you for all of your hard work as well as your entire staff and everybody in Burlington, uh, Burlington Public Schools. Thank you. So. All right, and hopefully you enjoyed our, or I don't want to say enjoyed, but hope you found our conversation as educational, as informative as I have. And enjoy your summer, or what's left of it, and I'll see you around town. Good night.